Give me a sec. So welcome everyone to our discussion on new research into the lived experience of open educational resources uh, creative practitioners with Dr. Alex Wanstruth. And this forms part of our monthly webinars on a gauntlet of different topics. If you haven't met us before, we're a friendly bunch of folk called um, the Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group of Ascolite. And our community is a diverse rainbow, includes uh, ed educational technologists, librarians, academics, school teachers, and more. Uh, and apart from our webinars, we meet once a month to connect with each other and share our current practices, how we're tackling different problems. Um, also, once a month, we put out the OEP, Open Educational Practices Digest, and that's a 360 degrees wrap of all things open education in Australasia, including the newest open textbooks fresh off the press. Um, so I'm going to make a shameless pitch. You can get this emailed straight to your inbox and hear about events by signing up on our website. Um, if someone can paste our website into, into the chat, that'd be great. And here's a cheeky snapshot of our previous webinars for the year. And we encourage you to get on our YouTube channel and check out all the topics we've covered over the last few months. Before we go any further, I want to recognize that this webinar is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and we acknowledge them as the traditional owners, at least in uh, Melbourne. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, uh, and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. This is a lovely artwork of Bunjil, a created deity in Indigenous mythology who often takes the form of a wedge-tailed eagle. And this was painted by the Wurundjeri woman, Judy Nicholson. So I'm pretty stoked to introduce our speaker today, who's been kind enough to stay up at an unearthly hour uh, in, the, in Virginia, USA, uh, to talk to us today. So thank you. <laughs> um, Alex is a former high school teacher Current, uh, currently a learning and development manager in the US, and he's used OER materials and open educational practices in the classroom as an educator and has used the same principles to build the learning and development department at the staffing firm that he works with. Um, and his PhD is in instructional design and technology, and he's really passionate about community learning growth and opportunities. So that's Alex. and. Now, take it away, Alex. All right, thank you, Stephen. Just give me a minute, let me go ahead and put up my slides here. All right, everyone able to see, good to go? Yep. All right, well, thanks for that introduction again. My name is Alex Wanshot, coming to you from the Eastern part of the United States. It's a little bit late here today, but it's a pleasure to join you all and kind of talk about my research and some of the different things that go along there. No research is complete without a very, very ridiculous title. So mine is a phenomenal, phenomenal logical, there we go, study on the lived uh, experience of creator practitioners of open education resources and practices in the United States. As Stephen mentioned, I am a PhD in instructional design and technology. Some of the things that I'll be doing and some of the context that I'll be setting is through instructional design principles. We'll talk about that, about that a little bit more on the back end as well. So for today, I'm going to give a little bit of background about the research, a little bit more about what's going on with the problem statement, the purpose statement, and of course, try to give some context since it was based here in the United States so that you all can get a better feel and sense for what was the context for this exact research and then what came out of it. You can see three uh, items that are highlighted there, the findings, the implications, and the theoretical and empirical implications as well. We're gonna focus in on that as the major parts today, but as we go in, we'll still cover some of the context that goes along with that. So first things first, you might've seen already, all right, what is this whole deal with creator practitioners? What's going on with it? Creator practitioners is a way that I wanted to describe people that not only created open education resources, but also use them in their classroom. So that became the OEP, the practitioner part, and brought it together this hyphenated word to describe how people are using OER and OEP within their own context. Now, as they're going through this, we're talking about the lived experience. So we have 11 participants in total. The research and the findings comes from these 11 participants all scattered throughout the United States. 
A couple of big things that we're going to find here. The student experience was paramount to each and every one of these creators, making sure that the student experience was really a top priority. We also talked about the instructor craft. So taking a look at how instructors continue to progress as their own lifelong learners, as well as what the community support was, whether it was OER groups, special interest groups, just like this, or otherwise, there is a huge factor of not just the individual instructor themselves, but also the community support that goes around them. We're also going to see and talk about how this shift is really paramount for the individual instructor to go from a power dynamic of that instructor as a knowledge transference. Here's what I know. Now I'm going to transfer it on to you as also a co-learner in the experience. So whether that's a facilitator and guide, as some of the uh, learning theory has talked about, whether it's learning centered uh, instruction, there's a lot of things that support that in a lot of different titles. But essentially, that individual instructor, that creator practitioner is not only helping along others, but also is on a learning journey themselves. And that becomes becomes very uh, apparent to the forefront. There's also an emphasis on community support, whether it's communities and, and discussions or whether it's uh, grant awarding communities. There's a lot of different things that go into exactly what it is that's going to support these creator practitioners. So just to set it all up, a lot of this uh, research was driven through social constructivism and how people learn and how they build together from the individual perspective to the community perspective to really how it goes into each and every pedagogical decision of that creator practitioner in their classroom to become a co-creator and a co-presenter with their students. Now, a couple of things in background to set up are right, where it is, how did I get here? Why is it that this is being researched overall? The open education resource movement really began in the United States early on in the 60s and into the 1970s, but as late, really started to focus in on some of the open licensing, especially through things like Creative Commons. Wiley's 5Rs, of course, became a really big part of some of that, but the big focus of this was really how do things go from open, which is accessible, free, redistributable, now into how are things open in terms of things, of, of textbooks, of pieces of art, right? What are these tangible objects or intangible digital objects that really become open. So we shifted from a mindset, from a creative process into actual products. The resources themselves, the open education resources started out into caches like Merlot or MOOCs, just like we have with open courseware and MIT, open textbooks, openly licensed documents. All of these things that were produced were described and labeled in the United States as open. And throughout most of this movement, what we're gonna see is a domination of open textbooks. So again, a major emphasis on the thing, not necessarily the creative process. However, as of late in the past six, seven, eight years, more and more open education practices in the United States have become an emphasis. Now, now part of that acceleration has been COVID, but also even getting into the mid 2010s as more and more technology began to speed up, especially instructional technology, there was kind of this, what I described as a mud, right? There, there's all these different things that come together for pedagogical approaches and technology that start to spur the creative process. What new thing can I do as a teacher to engage my students. And as that process became more and more, open education textbooks start to expand just from those pages into activities, into engagements in the classroom, into more and more creative interactions between people, not just those products. So some of the codification of this, as more and more researchers are coming in, open teaching became a bigger and bigger movement in Europe. We started to see OER-enabled pedagogy that was released by Wiley and Hilton in 2018. And even open education pedagogy or open education practices became a more and more common term that really took from best practices in education and learning theory and started to put them towards those open textbooks. So a couple of things. OER was heavily centered here in the United States to think about what is the cost. So these open textbook and its biggest value associated with costs. Although that was great and it gave access to a lot of students that didn't have the affordability for textbooks, there was also a, a paper that was published in 2019 from Grimaldi and his group about access hypothesis. Essentially, the value of open textbooks was simply that it was accessible, not that it was better, not that it was exactly on par with others. And some of the research wasn't really geared towards how good are these resources? How good is this community engagement? It was simply whether we got to an intervention on textbooks or no textbooks. And of course, having a textbook was usually better than not having a textbook. So what we're going to see is that heavy influence and heavy uh, research based into open textbooks really didn't allow for the practices of open education practices and what the implication of those OER textbooks could really do in the US. 
Now, because of COVID, right, we all have been through that. We know kind of what the story was of COVID. Technology started to accelerate. More people began to connect. And there were people that thrived on those open practices and allowing for that open share and community of virtual sessions just like this. So some of the cop some of the obstacles that came into effect were complexity of copyright, especially in the United States. How exactly do you navigate copyright and intellectual property? The social challenges of who exactly should be an expert? Are they allowed to write open textbooks? Are they not? Are they allowed to write engaging uh, different activities, supplementals, or are they not? And also institutional challenges. People did not get tenure and promotion. It wasn't understood. What was the value of open education? What was the value of producing an OER textbook? That research really wasn't there. It was simply seen as a community college type of stopgap and, of course, affordability. So we see all these mixes. We see OER, OEP. We see the learner-centered environment. We see the individual growth, but essentially this just comes to guessing. Is this something we could use in the open community? Is this something that we could possibly do? Are these open practices and these ways of engaging students, could we use those? And there were a lot of questions when I began my PhD journey that were still being posed and still being asked in 2020, 2021, into 2022. And my stab at this was to say, well, why don't we talk to the people that are actually doing this? What if we thought, hey, how are the people that are actually living as creative practitioners, how can we possibly start to engage them to learn more about, well, what was your journey? How did you get there? And how can we possibly encourage others to do exactly what they're doing? So the problem is there's no knowledge of that lived experience of these creator practitioners, people that create their own OER and then use it in their classroom to engage students openly in the in US higher education. So research has covered a couple of these topics, open and closed textbooks, OER adoption, OER creation, OEP theory, OEP implementation. And so all these little pockets around, well, what are the people actually doing in practice and in theory? So the purpose statement of this research was to find out and describe what that lived experience is of people who are actually doing this work. So let's get away from, well, what could happen in the classroom from that theoretical discussion into what is happening in the classroom and how can we replicate the successes that are going into that? So a couple of questions come up. The sub questions are kind of grouped into two things, right? Sub question one and two are essentially two sides of the same coin. What challenge or benefits do creator practitioners encounter from either OER creation, which is sub question one, or from OEP usage in their classroom, which is sub question two? Three and four, again, are similar. How do creator practitioners make decisions on what OER to actually implement? And then how do they make decisions on how to incorporate that open education practices? So not only what are some of the things that they're seeing from OER and OEP, but how do they make those decisions, right? From their perspective, as they're using it, what were some of the ways that they started to say, yes, I'm gonna implement this OER, I'm gonna go ahead and engage this, I'm gonna have open discussions, I'm gonna go ahead and create an open environment in my own classroom. So overall, 11 participants said yes to me and this crazy guy that was asking them and reaching out over social media, hey, do you want to participate on this? I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. We're going to go through a couple of hours of interviews and this and that. And some people were like, yes, let's do it. Finally came down to 11, but met a lot of great people along the way. And these educators have been using OER for at least one semester. Some of them have been using it for quite a bit, but that's just a little bit of background. Uh, participants were also current uh, faculty in the United States. That way, not only had they used it before, but they continue to use it as practitioners. Use journal entries, artifact analysis, and some of the uh, products that people were using. And of course, the mainstay of any qualitative analysis would be that semi-structured interview. So as you're going through the analysis, try to bring all this together, but the interview was the biggest part of it. So just a few ethical considerations, and the one that I really want to highlight here is down here, is research bias. As we all know on this call, right, there's a lot of great things about OER. We're enthusiasts, we're OEP enthusiasts. I had to temper myself and to say, okay, well, yes, I love it. I've used it in my own high school classroom here in the United States. I built my own textbook uh, for my social studies program. I was able to use it, engage it. I was, I was really enthused about going through this. But again, letting other people drive what is their lived experience became a really big and hard part of that. So as I was going through this, trying to bracket that as much as possible. So what did I find talking to these 11 folks that were still using this? A couple of things. There was an undeniable learner-centered environment approach. Each one of the 11, whether it was a science teacher, whether it was somebody in the humanities, in the, in the psychology department of their own university, all of them had a focus on learner growth. Some of the terms that continue to come up 
what was best for the student? How do I engage my students? How do I immerse them into the craft? How do I start to get them into lifelong learning credibility? How do I get into these different things to allow the learner to grow at the, at the best rate? Not just how do I test them? What are my metrics? How am I gonna find this? There were hardly any, any really talks about some of those. It was more about how do I focus on my students to do what's best for them? A big part of this also undeniably was technology. How do I deliver that growth to each and every one of them? Whether it's a learning management system, an LMS, whether it's uh, through just kind of a series of documents. Uh, one particular participant had built their own website to continue to have their students to engage, but there's always a technology uh, element to this because the distribution of some of their products of OER had to be distributed be able to be editable and reshared. So that technology element really does help boost some of that learner-centered environment as a delivery mechanism. The other part was, how do we get learners engaged? And part of that is going away from the lecture part to having an engaging environment into the actual class time. So whether you talk about flipped classroom, uh, whether you talk about a laboratory setting, uh, whether you talk about some kind of engagement, all of those things were happening across several disciplines to engage the learners in the time that they had them using the instructor as a guide where the content wasn't as much as the focus as much as the application so there were many uh, instructors that talked about hey this is open use all the different resources that you have let's start to test some of these things if we're doing science let's go ahead and engage in some of the labs let's see what's there let's talk about how the application is the most important part here so not only are we talking about student learning and student growth, but we're also talking about those higher levels of blooms in terms of the engagement. The other thing that's undeniable is the accessibility to engage. And a lot of people talked about how they needed that accessibility point. Student affordability, uh, some of these folks were in community colleges where the students did not have the ability to afford pricey textbooks. We also had a number of uh, the participants who were really heavily engaged in all kinds of accessibility, whether it was visual, auditory, uh, some kind of uh, modification to allow all students to engage, whether it was simplifying the text or whether it was engaging one way or another. The ability to access the information also led to the ability to engage in that information ultimately. So there was also a huge accessibility to that. But again, that comes back to that learner care. How do, how do in these instructors, these creator practitioners really care about their students? And when they show that care, it's through things like learner growth, application, that support in the actual course room, and to be able to give that accessibility to engage. The other part to this was power and control, how content is not only focused, but also how it's expressed. So with a lot of teachers uh, in higher education, what I found with uh, participants here, I should say, is how and when the content was delivered was a really big point. Now, some professors commented that early on in their careers, they had kind of this closed textbook. It was you could only access certain points. You could only get the content at a certain level or you had to access at a, you know only at a certain time when that information was available to you. What was interesting about these 11 participants is all of them commented that all of their information was available day one. It was all accessible. You could have it, you could engage in it, you can find whatever you want because it's more about the learning experience than the content itself. Whereas before, there's a lot of things that are focused on a closed textbook, onto closed content, onto closed information. There was a really big shift to say, well, the content really isn't the part. How you apply that content should be the focus. So we're seeing the power and the control of, here's the content, how should I release it? And to everybody should have the content, right? That open expression. But really, how is it that we're going to go ahead and engage it? The focal point here was that the instructor is going to give up power to the students. All right, how are we going to engage in this application, into this knowledge, into this understanding to be better able for you to grow, not just from what I think, not just what the standard is to think, but what it is to you individually, you personally. So again, going back to that care, trying to figure out for students what works best for that individual student as opposed to a mass quantity. So that focal shift has gone from the instructor as saying, I'm the most important thing in the course room. I'm going to shift that into say, the learner is the most important thing in the course room. How is it that each and every person through my door is going to be able to learn in my classroom and how can I best get that to them? The living expression of the content really comes in as we start to think of things like, how do we apply? How do we go through labs? How do you start to get into some of that information where some of that base level 
Uh, level one, level two of blooms in terms of that remembering or understanding really is already there and accessible, right? So getting past some of that, since we do have great content already on the internet, being able to engage in that content. Now, the other thing is a lot of these instructors talked about how hard and how difficult it was to actually shift to this, right? Learner set environment, power control, being able to get application, those, those things have been talked about for a long time in learning theory. But the actual nuts and bolts of getting there is something that's really, really difficult. Part of that is the, ch is the choice to sacrifice. And there's a couple of different ways that these participants sacrifice. It could have been that they sacrifice some of their semesters to be able to engage their later semesters. What I mean by that is going through the content, being able to learn from the content that they're creating, being able to build upon that. The learning experience for some semesters early on weren't as great as semesters later. But the instructor knew, hey, if I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to be brutally honest with my class. I'm going to let them know, hey, I'm building this for you. I'm going to make mistakes. I am a human. Engage this with me to make it better. And what all the 11 participants said is that that leap was terrifying to say, I'm going to give up control and power. I'm going to engage my students and we're going to do this collaboratively is something that's a huge, huge jump. And that goes into that second point on the cooperation, which is choosing to be vulnerable, saying I might not have the correct answer. I might be wrong. And that can be really hard for a lot of people. I know for me, that was super hard. I tried to do this with 16, 17, eight year olds and I got eaten alive sometimes in my classroom. It was, it was not the most pleasant experience, but later on choosing to sacrifice was something that really engaged the student and said, you know what? He really does care about us. He's going to make decisions that might be wrong, but it's for us in the end. And I got to experience that in some small part in my own experience, but the participants who are in higher education, even in those college courses, were saying the exact same thing. If I was able to sacrifice and be vulnerable, I had the ability to engage my students at a personal level. We could do this journey together. And it was really surprising to hear some of the stories that some of these participants said into that. Now, the other part of choosing to be vulnerable and choosing to be uh, choosing the sacrifice was to say, I'm not going to be an expert today, but I can grow each and every day as I go along this journey. And to select and to continue to choose to have that self-improvement was a big part to say, my product as a as OER, my product as a teacher, you know, teaching in this way of OEP is going to improve, but it's not going to be perfect on day one. And that's okay. And as I continue to improve my own craft, it's going to benefit more and more students. More and more students are going to see that genuine and you know improvement and engagement. And we're going to continue on this journey together. Now, without any, you know, that that whole idea of I can do this on my own is a great one. But we all know that it takes grant money. It takes money on that spend. There's an enormous amount of hours to actually write your own OER, to actually engage and to figure out and to go and find OEP. You have to do this outside of operating hours. That, that ability to get grants, especially from supportive networks, was enormous for all 11 participants. And even the participants that weren't in the studies that I, I still had an ability to connect to, the millions of dollars available in the United States for grants is a huge part of why there are these OER initiatives. So having that ability to have grant, being able to get the cooperation of support staff, whether it's uh, media specialists, librarians, or otherwise, was undeniably a huge part of this. No one does OER, OEP by themselves, right? Either selecting that they're gonna choose that cooperative environment with their students, as well as selecting and engaging with their professional network, whether that's an OER librarian, whether that's colleagues in different departments, whether it's people across the network, whether it's people across the globe, like we're connecting here, right? Whether Whatever that may be, no one can do it alone. It's really, really, really hard to do it in isolation. And there are great stories of people that not only were helped along early in their journey, but now have created themselves and put themselves into positions of mentors that are helping others. So much like they were supported, the cooperation and support staff of others is a huge part. That community of external supports is also a huge part into encouraging and continuing to move forward in that. Now, from the United States perspective, there's a couple of implications and some practical takeaways. One, all of these things can be implemented either in isolation, right, OER, OEP, or a combination of both. It doesn't just have to be creator practitioners. You don't have to just start from the get-go, but you do have to start. And that decision to start is a really, really hard one to get going, but there's a lot of people, especially as we continue to grow here in 23, that have a lot of experience in doing exactly this. Practice can be increment, incremental or it can be acute. So Cox and Trotter in 2017 had a paper that talked about the OER 
adoption pyramid, which is more or less Maslow, right? To, to, here's the hierarchy of needs to actually get to that OER adoption, talking about the institution. Uh, if, if there is a supportive institution on this, this can be implemented pretty quick. However, it does take time. Uh, there were many there were many creator practitioners that said, I did this and I created OER despite what my college was telling me. They were not supportive. I was not on a tenure track. I could not use any of this for my tenure and promotion, but I still did it anyway because I thought it was best for students. And that took an enormous amount of hours outside. It took a toll on them physically. It took a toll on their sleep. Uh, it took a toll on their marriages. It took a toll on their children, on their students, right? All of the things were suffering in that sacrifice period to have something produced better that came later. Now, practice must contain an instructor with confident expertise. And one of the things that I've found, and maybe you all have experienced this as well, is I have terrible imposter syndrome. I'm a PhD, I'm here talking to you all today. I don't think I know that much. And I'm here to share the little bit that I know, hopefully that it supports all of you. But there are many people, especially in the United States, especially people I've connected with, that don't think that they are credentialed enough to say what their expertise is in. I have my PhD in instructional design and technology. I've taught in the classroom for over a decade. I have somewhere in the ballpark of 6,000 training sessions that I've, that I've led, operated, executed, and evaluated. And I don't think I'm even close to talking on what you should do in the classroom, how you should build a presentation, or how you should speak on these presentations. However, if I were able to line my credentials up, I would say, oh, well, if I saw this in a textbook, I'd probably say, yeah, this guy probably knows what he's doing. And there's, there's this idea that we ourselves, as we live, aren't those people that can write, aren't those credentialed folks that could do the same thing? One of my participants had a great mention. He said, well, you know, the people that aren't sure if they should engage in OER, they say, well, I'm, I'm not really an expert. Well, have you taught this for a couple of years? Well, yeah. Have you, did you get your advanced degree in this subject? Well, yeah. Have you been you know, teaching this? Have you gotten your tenure and promotion? Well, some of them, well, yeah. Well, let's put those all out in bullet points take your name off, and then would you read a textbook by this person? Well, yeah, I would. We have a lot more authority. We have a lot more confidence. We have a lot of things that we can offer. And being able to say, well, I don't know everything, and that's okay, but here is what I know to add to the community pile, right? That's the whole concept of this community part of open education resources and practices. People have to be willing to take that leap to say, hey, I'm going to engage in my community, but I might be wrong. And that's okay. I can be helped. I can add my strengths and improve my weaknesses by doing this. But I have to be vulnerable and I have to sacrifice. Just like people do in this, in these participants and the, the 11 that did this in their coursework, this practice must come with that confidence to take that leap to be able to fully engage into it. A couple of policy takeaways. Uh, grant is availability for ancillary. So not only producing you know, OER textbooks, but also some of the production that comes along with that. Uh, assignments, assessments, let's say tenure promotion acceptance is a big one, although more and more colleges and universities here in the states are accepting OER and OER work as something that is academically rigorous. The majority is still not seeing it as such. So some of the practical specifics, learner centered environment, blended learning, 21st century learning, student ownership, or even Wiley and Hilton in their 2018 paper talking about student renewable assignments, all of those are big parts as well. So social constructivism is open as we start to have people learning in uh, ZPD and being able to engage themselves. This is a, a pretty big part of engaging in the open material, being able to manipulate the material digitally together is a huge part of this. So the social collaborative learning is a big part, instructor and learner engaging together also has strong theory for implication, right? Not just here in the open community, but also in strong learner theory, as well as learning psychology. The empirical implications, there's a corroborative element, right? There's OER textbooks that are huge in terms of you know, what their implications are, more and more research going on to what the impact is of that. OEP as learner-centered in 21st century learning, of course, we try to get more and more skills into that. And of course, there's some divergent elements. There's this idea of people, and should we focus on the people connection, the people relationship of OER, OEP, or should we focus on the product, right? What people are actually producing. Here in the United States, we still have a major focus on the product. We don't really have a major focus on how those relationships and those interactions, as we've talked about here today, are really affecting education. There's also a description of uh, creator practitioners. Of course, everyone has their own description, right? This is, this is newer in terms of the overall learning experience. And there's also a process versus destination divergence. 
meaning that once you have that OER textbook, for those of you that have your own or those of you who have engaged in it, you know it's not a finished product. Once you write it and once you're finished with it, it's a continual editing process. It's a continual engaging process. So as we're looking at this, OER is an, is, is an ongoing, never-ending process that people have to choose to engage into. Now, of course, there's limitations here, just a couple of things. As you know, the United States has a lot of people in higher education, the 11 people that are in this participant study, very, very small in terms of sample size, although I hope that more and more people read this, more and more people engage into this, say, oh, I could probably do something like this. Also, the deadline window, of course, there's practical implications for a PhD and participant uh, resignation was also one. I had a number of people that were, thought that they were able to participate and weren't able to uh, have resilience to finish out from one way or another. But again, things like this do come up and do happen. A few things here, uh, current instructors, US institutions of higher education, at least one term of experience, all these things still limit the overall participant numbers in terms of who I could reach, how I could reach them. There's still more participants that could be out there, just maybe they couldn't do it in spring of 2023 as we're going through this. A few recommendations here that I think are important for future research. First and foremost, OEP research for instructional approaches is a huge one. How not only learning theory and some of the learner-centered environment that we've already had, and sometimes for a couple decades, but how do we apply this to OEP, OER? Research a grant awardee cohorts to limit variables. What I mean by that is here in the United States, and I know that you guys uh, down there as well in the Southern Hemisphere have a lot of opportunities for groups to get grant awardees. If we're able to get some common controllables, it might show a better experience overall, as well as a larger volume of targeted case studies. More and more of these are coming out. I'm hearing more experiences come out, but again, there's not a whole lot on the lived experience of people and how they actually go through and engage and what their experience is in doing so. I'll go through my references here, but as we're taking a look, a few, few things just to wrap up. The, the instructor is the key point here. That person is the key point. Their audience is the key point. And it's all about relationships. It's all about how do we go from a power dynamic of knowledge transference to now a dynamic of co-learning, co-creation through technology, which we have with open education resources. So a big part of this and the thing that I'm most excited to tell you all about is that the people who choose to sacrifice, that choose to be vulnerable, that choose to be a lifelong learner, they are out there. They're much like you. They want to learn more. They want to do more. They are trying to engage. We haven't connected people a whole lot. And as big as the United States is, as big as Australia is, as big as our globe is, there are still a lot of people trying to do great work. So if you have friends, if you have uh, colleagues that are doing this work, connect them, right? Nobody does this alone. And the community is a huge part of this. Continue to encourage the people that do a great job on that. So I'll go ahead and close it there because I know I'm coming up on 30 minutes here. Stephen told me I got to keep it under. I'm really excited about this topic, but I'll go ahead and open up, up for questions, even unless there's something else that you want to jump in here for. Thanks. That was, that was really fantastic, Alex, and particularly liked your themes about pedagogy and in, interesting themes around uh, sacrifice, tension between confidence of instructors and the humility that you kind of were, were speaking to. So now, uh, now's your chance, everyone, to pick Alex's brain about anything he talked about or any part of his research. Feel free to either uh, unmute yourself and ask or type your question into the chat. Either is fine. Uh, Brendan. Yes, um, thank you, Alex. Very interesting. What I was most interested about, um, rather than the openness of, of the research you're talking about, was the idea of the creator practitioner. And I, I know you use phenomenology for your cohort. Um, I'm interested in the idea of a, a purpose-built methodology for people that are trying to understand the process of, of being a um, artifact creator. I wonder if you have any, any thoughts on that. I can give you an example. What, what I'm calling is what I'm calling this digital design research. And it's based on having iterations of the artifact whenever it's worked on, such as an explanatory animation, and then having a, a running commentary, such as a journal where you're giving a rationale for the changes. So you've got the product, which is the finished work, even though it may continue to be refined and the process as recorded in the journal. Yeah, so Brendan, I, I think you're going about things really well. It, 
part of it and what I've seen and what I've experienced myself is how do you go about your own learning, right? How do you get into a process to say, here are the, the steps that I'm taking. I know that for me, whenever I created something, it was more along the lines of, well, do I get to a finished product, right? Everything that I've been taught is I need to get to a finished product and then I can move on. With OER creation, it's not getting to a finished product, it's getting to a published product and then creating that perfection as you move. And the other thing that I think is really important to, to touch on is in that creation process, you're getting better at that artifact creation, right? By doing the thing, you will continue to improve on that. So keeping a journal, great idea, thinking about, right? Thinking about your thinking, thinking about your process is all a great deal. But coming to grips with the, the reality that once you publish, once you send out that product, that it's not finished is really the hardest concept. And then even beyond that, when you go to re-engage that project, you're going to be different than even a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. You yourself are changing in dynamic, which I think is really lost, right? As I talked about the, the focus on the actual product, a lot of people just think that this product lives separately from the individual who creates it. But the great thing is you as an individual continue to grow, be dynamic, have your own learning experiences, which then go into the product and can be a reflection of yourself. So I think that's a great way to go about it. What's the process? Put some structure around it, right? Start doing something and then see where your thoughts are. So I think that commentary is a great idea and I would encourage you just to keep going on that, but it's really just doing it. And that as simple as that sounds, I have a really hard time with just releasing a product before I think it's perfect. I think it's kind of the, the, the really tough thing about OER creation and artifact creation overall is, is to put something out that you know is not perfect. But again, we can't tinker with things for infinity. We do have to go ahead and publish it, see what the commentary is in there. Thank you. All right, I see a few in the chat here. Just give me one second to read a few, and then uh, I'll go ahead and respond to some of these as well. Yeah, the, the imposter syndrome, that's that's a tough one, right? We all kind of feel that sometimes, but that, that goes back to the previous question as well, talking about just putting out that product. That's the vulnerability that I was talking about, having that ability just to go for it and then you know see, see what ends up happening. And a lot of times when you get yourself embedded into a good community, there are people that are there to support you. That imposter syndrome definitely starts to... Uh, I wouldn't say go away, but it definitely evolves into something that's easier to allow you to engage more and more. Yeah, and then there's a question about uh, from Stephanie Davenport about um, unfinished OER and you know whether the participants in your research talked about you know they they create something, they publish it, uh, maybe they don't have the time or capacity to keep it updated, um, and it perhaps become static or outdated, huge task to cumulatively edit. Um, do you have thoughts on how people can manage that or how we can talk to people about that? Yeah, absolutely. And this this is really a, um, a hesitation for a lot of folks. There were some participants that jumped into an OER creation in a team and they seem to have a lot of success and resilience across a greater amount of time with that team because it was broken up, right? The delegation of that task was broken up into several parts. There were even uh, some instances of student participants helping to create into the OER product, whether it was ancillaries, it was things like assessment questions, activity questions, feedback scenarios, uh, some type of authentic questioning. There was the most successful ones were a collaborative process, right? You yourself as an individual, that is a massive task to undertake. That's why grants are hugely important that way that you can get some of that money because your time spend is gonna be hundreds of hours on these things. And to get compensation for those, the, that enormous amount of hours spend, right? That, that what you're paying is why grants are so important, especially here as I've talked to folks in the United States, I'm not sure exactly uh, how it is for you all, but the, the idea of that those hundreds of hours of spend, people are looking for compensation because people aren't gonna do it forever for free. 
there are a lot of people that will engage in that first version of the OER textbook or text or something or other uh, to Stephanie's question that don't get compensated. And then you look back at the sacrifice that you have and the no compensation. And then you say, whoa, do I really want to edit and go through this again? And, and most of the time it's it's no. So I would say to answer Stephanie's question, you know, is it okay being not being a finished product? Absolutely. But who is carrying that on? Is it the audience? Do you have engagement in the audience, right? Something like Lumen Learning, for example, that has a running uh, editing platform that says, you know, this person's engaging, that person's engaging, whether it's things like OpenStax that comes out of uh, Rice University here in the United States and Texas, whether it's uh, a number of in-house institutions that have collaboration, whether it's your OER librarian, for example, who else is there with you to help in that process? Because I really don't think getting an OER textbook or OER text to be able to be sustained can be done by an individual. It's it's really, really, really hard. You know, I would say kudos to you who are going to try it, but also look at all of us here in the chat. There's there's tons of people who are here that are willing to help out in some way, form or fashion. I would say as much as you can engage that community and hopefully that will get you uh, to the to the actual process that you want. But yes, you can deliver it without being finished. I've had participants, I've had others that are engaged that either put out chapters, put out individual items, or you know, put out things that weren't quite fully a chapter yet and build off of that over time. So it, you know, start with an outline, build out from there. I've seen that approach. I've seen some people just write out the entire chapter stop, pause, take a break, go to the next chapter, stop, pause, take a break. There's a lot of ways you can cut it up, but please try to do it in a collaborative team. It's gonna be much more helpful. It's gonna be much more sustainable. If I can just uh, continue on that theme with you, uh, one of the projects at Latrobe uh, involved uh, probably, I think four authors publishing an open textbook and they published the first four chapters uh but it it took you know some discussions and 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 addressing that anxiety before doing that because one of the fears was that their peers would see an incomplete work in public um and you know if you, you've put a book that is claiming to address you know xyz key concepts and only x and y are in there you know, does that create a certain perception? And um, wondering if you have thoughts about how to have conversations with authors about to, to either allay or just engage them around those anxieties of how they will be perceived in putting out a partially published book. Yeah, that's a great question. And part of it is, you know, back to the imposter syndrome. And part of it's back to, you know, what does my community think about me? And am I going to be received poorly because I'm not quite as credentialed as other people? I don't have a, a finalized thought, right? All these things are there. I know in talking to participants, their answer was, oh, some of them just didn't have as much of a care into what was perceived. They were more interested in what their students were perceiving. And from students, they didn't know that Z existed at that point. The X and Y was pretty good already. For colleagues that were engaging in this, there's of course backlash. I've heard stories from participants that they were ridiculed by colleagues, that they were saying that, you know, they're, they're this, that, and the other, they're fakes, they're frauds, they, they have incomplete thoughts, they have, um, whether it's this idea of grandiose, right? Here I am doing this, this really new age kind of open education resource, you know, engaging in this, but not having a full content library to engage others, right? People think that you have to be some kind of notable trailblazer at the top of your academic uh, content, whatever it is, but it, it's really not. You know, whether we see things like Wikipedia entries, whether we see things like uh, a shared activity, you know, whether you go back and forth with your colleague and say, hey, can you check out this activity that I've done, this, this section that I've done, this, that, and the other that I've done, all of these items are part of that, making that leap, making that sacrifice. And part of it is really more about, you know, even if it's incomplete, it's still something better than not being complete or not being out there, right? The thing that I look at and the thing that I've tried to come to grips with myself is if I don't put it out there, it can't be engaged to get better, right? I have to get over my own ego to say, can I focus on the content so I can learn more about that? Because I know there are other people that know more about this content than I do. What can I do to get better? What can the community do 
can do to get better, but we have a product, we have something to actually engage into and not just kind of gatekeep that information saying, well, it's in somebody else's head, but how do other people start to engage that? So it's not perfect, sure, but it's a good starting point. And I think it's really helpful to the community to engage in those kind of conversations and things, even if it's not fully complete. We did talk to them um, about putting front matter in the resource to um, make explicit why they made that decision and future updates that will be added. And that seemed to allay their anxiety quite a bit. So just thought I'd mention that. Um, Philip. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Alex. Thanks very much for getting lots out of this. And it's one th one thing you talked about in particular. I just want to just uh, raise because I'm not I'm part of the um, there's a there's an OER collective involving Australian and New Zealand university libraries, and I'm part of that and involved with three textbooks. And I, your comment about um, best to approach this because it's such a big task as a collective with more than <laughs> just one academic really ringing home to me because. I've got one of my academics who's just about um, was going to chuck it in because he had no he missed out on a grant and had no support as uh, doing it doing it. But what we've done down here is we've started phase one as DIY. The academics do it themselves with support from library and others. Um, and phase two is collaborative. So it seems to me it's maybe it's round the wrong way. Um, <laughs> it's just a, a comment, really. Yeah. Well, Philip, I think that that's really a common notion. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think to engage in any part of this is, is really good. What I've seen, and again, this is from a small sample size, and you know, I hope it, it helps, is that the, the notion to go collective with these items and the start a partnership from the get-go can really have, one, a delegation of tasks, and two, a, a common quality assurance check on one another, right? So let's just say we have two experts that are coming in the physics field and, and both are, you know, in their, in their respective ways, you know, experts in physics. And as they're going through that, having to enter into that relationship and say, well, I'm going to write this, you're going to write that. We'll go ahead and edit each other's work as we go along, right? That takes, that's doubling your power. That's doubling your right time, right? And part of that is just how quickly can OER go right? Because there's still a resilience factor to this. How long can I sustain building this chapter, this book, this whatever, right? And to Stephen's point, if it, it's released unfinished, that's okay still. There's there's still more to be written and that takes a long amount of time. And I don't think there's anything wrong with starting out on your own and, and kind of figuring out part of that is, well, is my stuff good enough to share with other people, right? And that's that's still a common theme. But I, you know, I hope that if uh, going through this, you kind of hear collaborative is, is going to work. I hope it accelerates for your teams. Hopefully, they get into that collaborative phase quickly. And uh, even if they're not finished, to go in and engage collaboratively, I've seen it work really well. Not to say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly your situation. I couldn't be the assessor for that. I know you would know a lot better than I. But going into this collectively would be a huge part of this as well. Let people see what they're doing. Let people make mistakes. Let people make corrections. And right, that collaborative community can be really supportive as well. Because just as vulnerable as I'm going to be, the other people in that collective are vulnerable as well. And we're all going to make mistakes, but if we make them together, somebody's going to catch it, right? We can talk about what would be best. And I think that it's more likely, I would say, I can't guarantee it, but I would say it's more likely to produce a higher quality product from the get-go, having that collaborative, being able to cooperate with others, lend their expertise into that product than just a single person and then go to the collaborative part. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. yeah. There's a question from Ash Barber, University of South Australia about the spread of participants in your study, um, what type of institutions particularly, and what disciplines? Yeah, so uh, I had participants from smaller community colleges, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 enrolled students, uh, up to large state universities. Uh, the largest one that I engaged in had an enrollment, I believe, of 40,000 undergraduate students. So some of these were smaller community colleges. Some of them were large state universities and kind of things in between. Uh, of the 11, I believe, if I can remember correctly, about six of them had enrollments that were 10,000 or less. So mainly geared towards smaller universities and colleges. But for the most part, there was a pretty good spread. 
Uh, talking about geography, most of them were located on the eastern half of the United States, which as you look at the population of the United States, most of the population is located on the eastern half of the US, just so from population centers, that just seemed to be how it went. Although I did have some universities on the western part of the United States as well. So I tried to be geographically diverse, trying to be uh, college size diverse as well, just to continue to have some of that larger spread. It happened that way. You know, I contacted thousands of people uh, over my time and that's, I was lucky enough to get that kind of spread. But again, 11 participants out of a pool, you know, there's thousands of educators here in the US. It's still a relatively small sample size. So I see Catherine's question in here about, about new research uh, openly publishing his PhD dissertation. I was unsure about OER versus the prestigious traditional law publisher. Uh, so I'll tell you all that I CC licensed my dissertation. So I believe that there's a link uh, that Stephen has as well that's pushed out here. Uh, Liberty University that I went through here in Virginia and the United States uh, has my dissertation. It is CC licensed. So please go ahead, share it, use it uh, as you as you are. So, oh, thank you, Ash, for dropping that in there as well. So you guys can access that. Uh, there is a really, really interesting um, young woman by the name of um, of Dr. Glass. I'm trying to think of her first name. She went through a media publishing PhD and actually crowdsourced her editing throughout each page. And Erin Glass, that's her name. So Erin Glass went through her PhD process, actually sharing in an open community her several chapters and got feedback from the community as she was going as another here's another part of my dissertation process and she actually documented it on her website so i'll uh, drop this in the chat so aaron glass is her name uh she had a really interesting journey i actually got a chance to connect with aaron a uh, really really brilliant young lady uh who who went through this process and talked about how brutal it was as well, because none of these things are, are easy to be vulnerable, but it, it is a way to share. I know that since my content was OER related, it made the most sense to CC license my dissertation. But again, I, I believe that's that's kind of the, there's more work to be done on OER. The, the dissertation is not the only thing. So whether it's producing things that are outside the dissertation and getting published you know, for your dissertation, whatever that looks like, I think as long as you still involve yourself in the community, that that's a that's a great choice. I made a big leap. Not many people have CC license their dissertations, but it was something that I thought was important to put out in the community and, and give talks like this. Well, we've got uh, two minutes till the hour, so I think if you can all please put your hands together for our wonderful speaker Alex today and thank you Alex for staying up so late yeah uh, of course and I thought I'd mention that uh you can get in touch with Alex on Twitter and I'm just pasting his Twitter handle in the chat and yes the link to his research if you want to read further into it any last comments Alex or uh yeah so one comment that I found in here that I, I do want to respond to uh, Philip asked if any of the 11s have grant money. The answer is not only did they have grant money, but multiple rounds of grant money, huge part of that. Uh, also, I'm available on LinkedIn. You'll find me under my name. Uh, please go ahead and reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's probably where I'm most active. And I'd love to connect with you all. I know that the time difference is gonna be a, a factor here, but please feel free to send me a connection, send me a message. I'd be happy to connect and continue this conversation. Thank you so much, Alex. And. Uh... Just for everyone who's still here, our next webinar is on the 29th of August, and it'll be on Plan E for Education, Open Education, and the Australian Universities Accord. Our speaker will be Richard Heller from uh, Universities of Newcastle, Australia, and Manchester. There you go. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Alex, for speaking, and we will send out the recording shortly. Thank you all.